the fresh stuff is the best stuff. It certainly is. I am so excited to be here with Chloe Valdery today. Hi, Chloe. Hi. And I, on my channel, I have sort of a, a tradition when I have somebody new on that we start with your story. If you would be willing to tell us a little bit about your story, mm. how you came to be Chloe Valdery, and <laughs> how you, came, <laughs> you know, how you grew up, how you came to have the ideas that you have, and then tell us a little bit about your project. Sure. So I'm from New Orleans originally. I grew up in a very interesting family. Uh, I grew up in an atypical Christian family. Atypical in the sense that as a Christian, I grew up observing a lot of Jewish, culturally Jewish holidays uh, and rituals, including, uh, you know, Shabbat in some form. So instead of going to church on uh, Sunday, I attended church on Saturday, for example. Um, instead of observing Christmas and Easter, I grew up observing Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And so this created a sense of uh, cultural, I guess you could say, diversity in my life. Uh, um, and also it gave me the sense of an insider-outsider relationship with multiple different cultures. Um, so I was both, you know, firmly within the Christian community, but also simultaneously outside of it because I did not keep a lot of the tr what is traditionally considered to be Christian. Um, but, it, but part of that upbringing and part of that sort of educational experience um, gave me a sense of inquiry and gave me a sense of intellectual curiosity because my family was always sort of like researching the past and researching the the meaning of certain traditions and the background of certain traditions and so i developed that tradition within my own i guess sense of self and sense of identity and um so that was how my upbringing was i think that's probably that was probably one of the most significant aspects of my upbringing um and in addition to that my first passion my first uh one true love was actually film and screenwriting so speaking of story wow and the uh, importance of story. Um, at first I was gonna be a filmmaker. I went to, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the movie Fame, mm -hmm. um, I think from the eighties, um, but it depicts you know, this school where you can go study the arts. Mm -hmm. So I went to regular high school for half the day and then I went to a contemporary arts school called NOCA uh, where I studied film and screenwriting. Um, and that was my, that was a large part of my high school experience. So that was impactful. And then when I got to college, I replaced film with international studies because I became interested in Israel. And I had an Israel club and did like Israel activism and advocacy. And that entailed, you know, learning how to put on events and tabling and really trying to uh, get people to come to my events and be interested in some of the things that me and my friends were talking about. Um, and then I graduated in 2015, moved to New York because I got a job at the Wall Street Journal. And I, at the journal, worked on a thesis, which was a product of my time in college, um, because I really wanted to figure out how to give people a sense of emotional maturity to be able to deal with complex topics, to be able to talk about conflict, to be able to talk about just challenges in general. Um, and in the world of international diplomacy, there's always this question of how do, you, how do you combat conflict, but there's not necessarily the question of how do you actually get people to learn how to love. And so what I wanted to tackle was that central question in this thesis. Like, is there a way that I can develop a framework to teach people how to love? So mm -hmm. that even when they have to talk about difficult topics, they can do so in a way that's holistic and healthy. And so at that point, I said to myself, well, if I want to see how to teach people how to love, maybe I have to ask, well, what are people already in love with? And how do I use that as a conduit to teach them how to love? And so for me, the biggest source of content that showed me what people were already in love with was pop culture. And I considered pop culture to be defined as the collection of, really the collection of stories that are part of our, that are part of the fabric of our civilization. And these stories can show up in the form of anything from, you know, uh, literature to TV commercials for Nike. They're all still teeming with the same sort of depiction of the hero's journey. 
Um, so at that point, I started studying companies like Nike and started studying companies like Disney and influencers like Beyonce to see if there's a common pattern in the stories that they were telling to sell their product. And the stories that they were telling was basically they were creating content where their audience saw themselves and their potential reflected in the content. And that's why we bought their product. And so I was like, oh, okay, so that's what you have to do. You have to create content where your audience sees themselves and their potential reflected in the content. And I call this phenomenon enchantment because enchantment sort of captured the sentiment that we as audience members felt when we uh, encountered some of these stories, some of these Disney movies, for example, and some of these uh, you know, Beyonce songs. We would, we would be delighted or filled with a sense of wonder and awe when we would see these things. And so I thought that enchantment was a good term to try to define the process by, by which one uh, gains affinity for or love for another human being or another idea or another uh, personality. So I called that the theory of enchantment. And then I finished the paper. I worked for a nonprofit for two years lecturing on this concept of enchantment in college campuses around the country and in some parts of Europe as well. And eventually enough people kept telling me, you know, this isn't just applicable in international studies. It's applicable in social emotional learning for high school students. It's applicable to professional development and folks getting along with each other in the workplace. So you might want to consider taking this 45 minute stump speech that you have and expanding it into an actual body of work. Um, and so enough people told me that at some point that I decided at the end of uh, 2018, December 2018, to go on my own, to start a company called Theory of Enchantment and to create a, a full 25 lesson course that uses pop culture to teach things like character development, resiliency, um, and teaches people how to love so that you know, less conflict is, uh, or conflict is less likely in the long run. Wow, that was a great recap, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'm happy it wasn't too long. Yeah. Well, no, I'm always worried about that. No, no, we're, we're used to talking here. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I have a couple of questions from what you were just talking about at the end there. And you mentioned about the hero's journey. And I wondered, mm -hmm. um, was that something that you had studied in college or had you run across that idea someplace? Or did you just notice it yourself arising out of the work that you were looking at? I think I noticed it arising out of the work that I was looking at. I noticed that it was the pattern that kept being repeated in so many like forms of advertising for products and so many pop culture, pop music that was, you know, on the radio at the time. It was the, probably the one singular pattern that kept coming up over and over and over again. Well, because I know we, we share an interest in Jordan Peterson. Mm -hmm. and of course, that's, that's been the a bulk of a lot of his teaching. So I wondered if you had run into him before or if you ran into him after. I ran, I ran into him after. So I ran into Joseph Campbell earlier, early on. I don't remember when, but I, I ran into Joseph Campbell early on with the uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces. And that's how I also got introduced to Carl Jung. But I didn't get introduced to Jordan Peterson until after. And I also got introduced to Camille Paglia prior to oh. being introduced to Jordan Peterson, so. Yeah, wow, that's a, that's a bunch of great thinkers there. Yeah. The other question that came up for me is when you were talking about enchantment, I wondered if, if enchantment works both ways, if it's not only enchantment towards the positive, but you know, where we usually run into enchantment in fairy tales is when you're enchanted mm. into a trance or a, you know, sure. sort of a negative the enchanted state or, you know, like King Theoden of Rohan in Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Or, yeah. So in the context of my work, I use enchantment in a, with a positive connotation just because I also, because I teach so much Disney, um, I think enchantment within the Disney, within the Disney universe typically has a positive connotation. And also I use, a, I use it with a positive connotation because for me, enchantment and having a sense of wonder, um, which, which is a part of what Peterson defines, I think, as the heroic uh, character and so he defines in maps of meaning he says that the hero uh, the heroic impulse is to basically encounter the unknown with a sense of its benevolence as opposed to like shirk back and be intimidated by you know the risk that one necessarily encounters when um, encountering the unknown so in that sense 
in the sense that, you know, I think of enchantment as a sense of wonder um, when confronting the unknown. It's a positive connotation uh, in the way that I use it. Well, so that puts you in kind of a unique space, really. Because the thing I notice when I talk to some of the postmodern young people, mm -hmm. that they do not come at um, the unknown as, as a benevolent force at all. They tend to look at, even if they do accept the idea that there is a God or that this universe was created somehow rather than accidental, they think of him as being evil, twisted, um, mm. set on their destruction, you know, that he, he saw all the suffering that would come out of creation and still permitted it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if you've run into that thought process in other young people, but it seems to be a postmodern picture where benevolence is not, uh, benevolence is not allowed. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting observation. I don't know that I've, I've seen in a lot of other young people per se. It definitely is a thing in general, I think, in our politics uh, right now that sort of uh, transcends like different, it transcends specific uh, age demographics in my experience. Um, but I can't say that I've seen it overrepresented in, for example, my generation among millennials. Um, it's possible that it does exist or it is overrepresented in millennials. I just haven't, you know, been privy to it. Mm -hmm. But I do think that a, like what you just described comes from, at least in part, a refusal to confront the fact of one's own existence. Uh, and the complexity one's own, of one's own, one's own existence and existence. one's own place in the world and one's own self, which is actually um, a very risky thing to do because in order to confront oneself or to acknowledge the fact of one's existence, one has to acknowledge the fact of one's mortality. You know, one has to acknowledge the fact, the perpetual fact of imperfection. Um, and a lot of people for better or for worse, can't really handle that. Um, but a lot of people weren't even encouraged to necessarily do this. And I, and I think this is definitely the case for young people. Like, I don't think a lot of young people have sort of been, um, you know, deputized by their parents or by society at large to actually wrestle with themselves um, and to ask themselves, why is it that I'm here? What is my purpose on earth? What is it that I want to accomplish? You know, how can I create order or meaning out of chaos? I don't think I don't think these questions have been these questions have not been explicit or implicitly raised in a lot of like you know institutions of higher learning. So, well, so here's a thought that I've been playing around with a little bit. Um, it was you you challenged me to go back and reread the section in Jordan Peterson on the Great Father. So, mm -hmm. I've been I've been in the second half of that book for two years probably okay my way through a lot of stuff but i'm on the part I, with the adversary by the way right now okay yeah i hadn't i hadn't gone back and looked at the great father section for quite a while and it, there was really a lot of good stuff in there and one of the things that he talked about triggered a, a memory for me of when my daughter was uh, a baby mm -hmm. she was like six months old and i noticed this tendency every time she was just about to acquire a new skill just before she learned to crawl, just before she learned to walk, just before she learned to talk, there would always come a period of frustration. Okay. That, that frustration was, I see something I want, I see something I desire, mm -hmm. I think I could get it, but I don't have the skill needed to get there. And, and the way Jordan Peterson described that was that the object of desire is so intense that it triggers in the individual a willingness to suffer the consequences of what it would require to develop the skill in order mm. to get the thing desired. But then the, the, the beneficent side effect of that is once you've acquired the skill, now you could have a lot of things that you desire, not just that one thing. So that one thing is no longer the only target. Sure, yeah. So you have a new set of skills, you can acquire more things, but then that makes even higher things your target, and then you have to acquire skills to get to that target. And so I was talking with another fellow this morning about this, and I said, why is it that um, 
a baby has just endless energy to go after that thing, even if it is difficult. And as we become adults, it's much easier to just relax yeah. and not do the thing. And, and he said, I think it's the sense of wonder that a baby oh, has. That's interesting. You brought up yeah. that sense of wonder. And so yeah. I wonder if there isn't some connection there with that this sense of wonder kind of activates our willingness to experience the trials of life in order to get the meaning that's there rather than just kind of rest in our comfort zone. Yeah, I think that if one has a positive orientation toward life in general, if one's perspective is rooted in, again, the idea that encount encountering the unknown is not only necessary, but brings out or is what makes heroism possible, um, the one is more likely to just be more willing to encounter it. And it's possible that also as, you know, infants, because we haven't really experienced such uh like total rejection or absolute destruction we mm -hmm. in a way we're ignorant of those things right and so mm -hmm. and so perhaps that also plays a role in terms of our willingness to just sort of go go pursue things because we don't know what rejection actually means or we haven't really encountered rejection and then the, and then um you know we haven't really been negatively affected by rejection, at least as infants, the only thing, it's the only thing we know is to sort of go forth. And so I think that combined with that sense of wonder probably um, helps to explain why as infants we're so much more willing to do the work necessary and take, you know, and embark upon the sacrifices necessary to get that the thing that we want and then continue to do so. And the question is, of course, like at what point in life does that start to decrease that willingness and why does it start to decrease yeah so when you said rejection i thought that was really interesting because an infant a toddler a young child will experience lots of failure yeah it doesn't seem to stop them they just yeah. up and start over again so is it when the you know jordan peterson is always talking about um the way to really make a person suffer is to make them make them suffer when they've done when they've done something good to punish mm. them for do, having done something good that's that causes more suffering than punishing them for having done something bad oh well, that's interesting that sounds like it would be an element of the tyrannical father yeah yeah right right yeah or or what he calls the tyrannical mother. <laughs> sure. Yeah. But I just thought of like, because I know his whole thing about the tyrannical father is like, the tyrannical father specifically punishes creativity, right? Because the tyrannical father is obsessed with order and too much order and too much rigidness, um, obviously, is, describes the tyrannical state. And so if the young person is embarking upon something that is good, but is also an anomaly, a novel, you know, uh -huh. to, then the tyrannical father might want to squash that. And that might, that might be what he's describing when he says it's at least even more suffering, you know? Yeah. Well, so that, and that goes into that rule. Don't, don't, um, don't put, punish a kid who's skateboarding. Um, yeah. <laughs> because they're out there risking, right? They're yeah. trying, they're risking. And um, yeah, that's really interesting. So so I I clipped out of, I took a bunch of notes as I was reading and I just pulled out little bits here and there. And I thought I would maybe hand you some of these small quotes and see what you okay. make. Because sure, there's, there's too much to cover the whole thing. Yeah. But I thought we might be able to just play around with some ideas. Um, one of the things he says is voluntary confrontation with emergent anomaly is the best bet. Yeah, so he, I think he says that this is like one of the number one qualities that makes a hero a hero is the willingness to voluntarily confront the unknown. Um, and that resonates with me because I also think that's what I think of when I think of the artists. Like I think that they, for me, the hero, the hero and the artist are synonymous. Um, as ideas, as archetypes, and it's the artist's task to voluntarily confront the unknown, which is to say voluntarily confront chaos 
and turn that chaos into meaning by way of creating art. Um, so, I mean, this is, sort of, this is less of a, the archetype of the father and more the archetype of the hero. But the, of course, this person is a product of both the benevolent father and the benevolent mother, right? Uh, mm -hmm. This person embodies the good characteristics of both. Um, and one of those characteristics is to view the unknown and or chaos um, for the positive elements that come from encountering it as opposed to being um, so terrorized by it and so overcome by it that one just decides to be inactive. Um, and one other thing, this, is, this has really influenced my views on nihilism, which I think is cowardice, basically. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, that would be my very like quick summary of what I think of that statement. Well, I love that you brought up the artist because that was the first thing I began to notice. When I started mm. reading that book, Maps of Meaning, it was so difficult because he was talking mm. about many disciplines that I've never studied. He was talking about all sorts of psychologists' ideas and philosophers and, and uh, history and, and things that I hadn't delved into in the past. So I'm, I'm swimming through this ocean of stuff. Yeah. And, and at a certain point, it sort of snapped into focus for me. And I realized the thing that snapped it into focus for me was I am an artist. And so um, in refining my own sort of method and style, I've studied creativity for years, mm. and especially the elements and principles of design. Mm. And the elements and principles of design just laid right over the top of maps of meaning and it acted like a translation key almost. So I could be reading some paragraph in that book that would, didn't make any sense to me at all until the key occurred to me. And then once the key occurred to me, it was like, oh yes, I get exactly the same thing. So when you said that about art and creativity or about, about the artist and the hero, my personal method for painting is, and I've done this for years, long before I ever heard of Jordan Peterson, I create a bunch of chaos on the canvas mm. as much as I can. And then I look to see what's there. Mm. Then out of it, I create something. Um, because I'm not good at just taking a blank sheet and yeah. superimposing something on it. And go through this other process. So it's as though I was talking to a physicist one day, and he was talking about stochastic resonance as a way of. Um, well, what's that? Well, it's a. Uh, I think stochastic just basically means random, but it's an okay. idea where, when they have a, let's say they have a, a audio of some sound, but the mm -hmm. sound is not adequate to understand what they're saying. Okay. They will add some additional random resonance to it. And mm -hmm. that will somehow interact with the signal that's already there and amp part of the signal so that it So then you can discern it? So that you can discern it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So that's exactly the way it looks to me when I'm doing this art. I've got all this chaos on there. And at a certain point when I had just enough, mm -hmm. it's like it'll it'll Come into focus and i'll see oh there's a woman in there yeah maybe there's something behind her and and then i'll start working with that it's like so you're, it, you're it, basically it, able to like sift it out yeah 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 and and sometimes it takes i might get started on something and then i have to add more chaos in order mm. to amp the signal for myself yeah and that's cool that's that with the hero's journey they're always going over into the chaos to see what's there that's useful to bring back to revivify yep. the the two structured order. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, it's interesting how it's lich it's so meta. Because <laughs> it's apl applies to so many different uh tradi literary traditions. You, you find it in literary traditions, you find it in, you know, the arts writ large. It's it's such so, it's such a part of our DNA, you know, our biology as human beings, and it's really fascinating to. And that's the other reason why I call it enchantment, because I'm filled with wonder at the idea that th these patterns have existed in so many different forms throughout 
for, for as long as we've existed as a species. And that is crazy to me. That's like, that means that we are correct when we consider these things timeless. They're actually timeless. Mm -hmm. And so we can expect to have these, uh, these sort of wise teachings continuously come up throughout every generation because we're, we're not going to stop being human. And so for as long as we're human, these are going to be things that are necessary to learn and relearn and relearn, um, you know, throughout the ages. Well, and for the two years I've been messing around with this channel, I've been talking to physicists and chemists and, and uh, technology entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. computer scientists, and it is completely meta. It yeah. runs through everything. Yeah. <laughs> Not just art, it, it runs through everything. That's wild, yeah. It's like, it's like becoming privy to the pattern, to the code, which is the name of your podcast. It's yeah. like becoming privy to the code of creation itself. It's like crazy. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so here's another quote. Okay. In gratitude, tends to see only the tyrannical side of the father, not the benevolent, creative, and protective side, which I guess we've already covered to an extent. So let me just add on to that one more thing. Sure. Those who climb the hierarchy with politics and power resent those who are climbing with competence and creativity. Oh, that's interesting, given what we're dealing with right now in American yeah. society. Uh, and given that power has become such a such an objective uh, in a lot of political conversations being had right now, power for its own sake, not power in order to create uh, you know meaning out of chaos or to imbue the lives of your fellow human beings with meaning, it's just power for its own sake. Um, and yes, it it is the politicians or, or folks in the political world not necessarily just politicians, but folks who speak with a, um, a hyper-political language and therefore desiccated language, um, who think that everything is political. Um, and I think, I think maybe it was Camille Paglia who actually said, or maybe, maybe it was Camille Paglia, maybe someone else who said that if once a society thinks that everything is political, it's proof that that society's culture is in decay. Mm -hmm. If you think that everything is political. So I'm thinking of that uh, idea when I think of the statement. Also, to your earlier point about, you know, ingratitude, I would say yes, like this, the, the person who sees only the tyrannical aspects of the father doesn't understand the importance of order <laughs> and um, of rules and of discipline in society, um, doesn't understand that without that there's total chaos and that, you know, we can drown in chaos, we can die, we can die, we can literally, our culture can become dead by too much chaos. I think we're seeing that right now because of the effects of COVID-19 and, and things of that nature. So yeah, I would agree that that person who only sees the tyrannical aspects of the father doesn't understand the other side um, of the, the, the benevolent aspects of the father that provides security and order and balance um, without which you couldn't exist as a human being. If everything was constantly chaotic, right? You wouldn't, you just wouldn't be able to function. Um, so yeah, I would agree with that. Well, in, in one of the quotes I, I think I picked out from you maybe, that on the other side of tyranny is not freedom, but chaos. Oh, maybe I said that, you? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> if it was either you or Jordan Peterson. But anyway, I think there it's you a go. <laughs> idea. And yeah. I, I want to kind of use that to bring us back to your uh, opening salvo when you were talking about love and how you started all this because you wanted to teach people about love. Mm -hmm. um, earlier today, I was writing some things down and, I, and one of the things I wrote down was that communication has enough difficulties of its own, but those difficulties get magnified if you hear everything through an ideological lens. If you hear yes. always that this political structure governs everything that a person says, then mm -hmm. when you hear what they say, you can't separate their idea from the person or from mm -hmm. their, the box that you assume that they live in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then you, caricature you, them. Can't, you can't separate your own ideas from your own box. 
Yeah. And that's what we've done. We've, we've limited ourselves into these little, I think John Bervake calls it reciprocal narrowing. We've just kind of mm. made ourselves into smaller and smaller and smaller circles. There's a thing yeah. in physics where they talk about particles that will eventually crystallize into a complete crystalline structure if you just remove enough space. And that's the way it is. The ideas become so lacking in entropy and lacking in potential information because everything mm. is solidified into this one thing. So you can't hear what another person is saying. You can only judge them because you've already adopted their entire point of view. If they say A, you know that what they really mean is A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Right, right, right. yeah. <laughs> right? And so until you can learn to separate the person from the idea and leave an open space where you can see both ideas simultaneously, your idea and their idea, you can hold them both loosely and try to find if there's a space between there for some sort of creative endeavor, mm -hmm. you can't really have real communication because it, it's, even at the best of times, it's difficult for me to say something through my filter and have it go through your filter and have it mean anything at all. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like in general, that's a difficult exercise. Yes. I think this goes back to my observation that like what you said earlier about a person not being able to even understand their own positions outside of the political structure in which they exist is, is a perfect indication that they have no real relationship with themselves. Which, I, which is why, which is what I think a lot of these, uh, you know, issues that arise in society stem from. It's like James Baldwin was talking about this in the '60s, how how individuals did not have just a basic relationship with themselves, how everything was like a set of attitudes toward uh, ideas, as opposed to like thinking through ideas on your own and using your own intelligence to come to your own conclusions. It was sort of like you're taking cues from the society around you and you're assuming. That whatever the majoritarian political structure is, that is what defines you as a human being. And so we have a lot of, uh, of fixing or healing to do <laughs> because this is really far more prominent than I thought. Um, and I'm seeing that now with a lot of what's going on in America, um, you know, during, during COVID and everything that's going on. Um, there are a lot of, you know, Peterson uses this term, the ideologically possessed. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of ideologically possessed individuals and institutions right now. And I, I don't think I really realized that uh, prior to this moment that I'm living in right now. Yeah, well, I, I'm a lot older than you are. So I've had a chance to kind of watch this happening. Mm -hmm. And I started noticing it when I was. 30 but that's only because that's about the time I woke up I didn't wake up okay. as early as you did <laughs> so I sort of woke up to wait a minute there's a lot of things going on in the world right now well it, and it was during a time that was very similar actually because it was in the late okay. 70s there were many many um, hugely difficult economic issues and, mm. and geopolitical issues going on in the U.S. back in 78 and that's about the time when I kind of came to and started reading a lot of stuff and mm -hmm. and and then I took a look at things and I noticed wait people are kind of stuck in these tracks um but it's become increasingly worse over the years um mm. and I I kind of hang around with a lot of people on the internet that are associated with Jordan Peterson's ideas and one of those guys is Paul Vanderclay Okay. And he's been doing a lot of YouTubes about the meaning crisis, trying to mm. figure out the meaning crisis. And jo John Verbeke has been doing a lot of things about the meaning crisis as well. And certainly over my lifetime, this meaning crisis has gotten more and more and more exacerbated until I would mm -hmm. say, you know, we are totally, we're in it now, baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, you have these these two polarized ideas and without love mm. there's no way that those two people can communicate with each other but love says i'm going to accept you as a person mm -hmm. regardless of what your ideas are because yep. i want to really know you 
Mm -hmm. not just your ideas. I want to really know you. Yeah. And, um, um, there's this really interesting verse in the New Testament, John chapter 10, verse 24, mm -hmm. where they've come to Jesus and they say to him, this is kind of the Greek translation that I like, <clears throat> how long are you going to keep us suspended between two, how long are you going to keep our souls suspended between two options? Mm. Tell us. If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Mm -hmm. And and I sort of saw that as, wow, that was the, that was Christ's superpower, really. I mean, <laughs> he had many, but but it was his um, it was his gift to us that he could open up this space where two things could exist simultaneously. simultaneously. Yeah. So they Paradox. didn't know if he was the Christ or wasn't the Christ. But yeah. if he said, I am the Christ, they would have judged him for saying right. I am the Christ. And if he had said, I am not the Christ, they would have judged him for saying, I am not the Christ. But because they didn't know, they could. Here's what happens when you withhold judgment. Mm. When you judge, then all your emotions get triggered. Oh, he believes that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Therefore, yeah. you're in this box. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. All, and, all, and all your emotions get triggered. You get flooded. You mm -hmm. can't think anymore. But when you're not in a judging state, but you're in a loving state, mm -hmm. you're fully capable of thinking things through. You can be reasonable. You can be logical when you're yeah. in that open state, right? You can also depersonalize a lot of things because you understand that your sense of self-worth is not predicated upon someone agreeing with your opinion because it transcends that opinion itself like it's not that's not where your your self-worth is not found in your ability to hold the right opinions about you know there's something more uh rooted and transcendent simultaneously um that i think a, a human being's self-worth can be found in and again that's something else that hasn't really that in order to know that that requires an education um, people have to be, actually be taught that and people haven't been taught that um people haven't been taught like to have a sense of internal worthiness um within themselves um and so they are seeking everywhere for validation and especially i think in politics they're they're seeking for sort of an affirmation of the meaning of their own life in politics which is why you see a lot of the large visceral and rageful shouting matches that are going on in our polarized politics today um all of this it represents an imbalance of the spirit and a and a and a failure to recognize um the eternal worthiness of oneself and of course that can that can redound to the community and to the nation um and you know this goes back to the idea of the artist like i you know i dj my dj name or moniker is paradox this I, and it goes back to this idea of being able to hold simultaneous concepts at the same time and play in that space um and understand that and and this goes back to the archetype of the hero right the hero is as i said earlier the product of both the benevolent mother and the benevolent father combining those two things together combining those two spaces together so so yeah, I just, uh, there, there's a lot of basic things that are taught in developmental psychology about, you know, how to have, how to have a healthy life mentally that just hasn't, that has been totally neglected, I think, um, in terms of like the way parents have raised their kids and the way the education system is run. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to, there's a lot to overhaul. Well, so how did you come to the place of having such a healthy self-worth that you're able to put together a, a, a learning system like this and help others? Um, <laughs> it's a good question. I think that I think it's a product of many things. You know, my parents raised me with to have intellectual curiosity. It's interesting because I grew up in a very religious home. And in some ways it was unfortunately dogmatic. And so I recognized later on in life, the unhealthy aspects of that, but, um, but it was simultaneously, uh, it simultaneously valued 
intellectual curiosity. And this is sort of the Pandora's box that my parents didn't know that they were opening <laughs> in giving me an education that tried to balance both of those two things. Because what that means is to live, to, to, be, to be educated in a tradition that combines both orthodoxy and inquiry, there's both tension between those two things, but also a balance between those two things. And so um, being able to feel comfortable in questioning orthodoxy, but still having a respect for orthodoxy, I think made me inclined to, um, number one, to, to, to be able to find patterns in different aspects of the culture where other people aren't necessarily able to see that so so obviously um mm -hmm. that's number one and number two uh to to be privy to the idea of archetype it's just na it's just a natural thing that came out of like how i was raised in my upbringing i think um and so all of, all of these things combined to to you know create the person that I am today. And I'm still a person who's constantly developing, constantly learning, constantly evolving. I'm sure 10 years from now, I'll be a different person as well as this natural progression of living. Um, but I think I just became comfortable with, on, on some level, I became comfortable with the unknown because I, I did have to question my upbringing at some points. And I did have to encounter the, I did have to like really wrestle with the fact of my mortality and I really did go through that stage in college where I like really wrestled with that existentially. And, you know, Peterson talks about how Tolstoy did this. He, he, he points out some passages where Tolstoy thought Tolstoy had to wrestle with his, like the existential anxiety of being alive, knowing that you're going to die one day. Um, and I, I went through that in college. So I think that all of these things contributed to an emotional maturity that I hope to be able to, um, you know, to spread throughout the world. <laughs> well, how is your project going? Are, are you are you gaining traction? Do you, do it you... is, yeah. It's really growing, which is really exciting. There are a lot more people finding it now. And it's interesting because it's, it's one of those things that actually thrives in crisis, right? Because like I was doing this since 2018. And once COVID-19 happened, all of a sudden, things really started happening in terms of people becoming aware of theory of enchantment, people buying and enrolling in a theory of enchantment course, far more people have enrolled post COVID or, you know, um, than, than pre COVID. And again, I think it's because I am, because of some of the experiences that I've had in my life, I know what it's like to encounter cognitive dissonance. And I know what it's like to realize that the way I thought that the world worked is not the way the world works. And I think that a lot of people went through that experience for the first time when COVID-19 hit. And so Theory of Enchantment was equipped and is equipped to help people deal with that. And that's a part of life, right? Like chaos, we're always on the brink of chaos, which is something that a lot of people, I would say most people don't realize. We are always on the precipice of a rude awakening. This is a nature of the human condition. Um, and I think that the Theory of Enchantment just helps people um, it equips people with the mental tools to be able to deal with that. So um, is it all online, the course? Yes, the entire course is online on a platform called Teachable. So if folks are interested, they can check out theory slash of slash enchantment.teachable.com. Um, and it's 25 lessons. Each lesson is roughly 60 to 90 minutes long. Some lessons are longer because I teach entire films in the course um but that's fun so it's okay uh but yeah so it's also it's cool because i think it goes one step further in terms of recognizing timeless wisdom like it pulls timeless wisdom not only out of you know the stoics but also shows how the disney's the lion king contains stoic teachings in it and like how even nike ads contain uh certain fundamental truths about the human condition that will always be true and about the hero's journey nike is really famous for that you know mm -hmm. um and so it's cool because it it is able i think to speak to a younger generation while also speaking to older generations that may have encountered stoicism and um you know other classics classic teachings in college and things like that do you do you mainly market to a certain age group or 
Yeah, so the theory of enchantment is for individuals ages 14 and up. So I've taught teenagers, I've taught professional development teams and corporate settings. Um, so I would say it's, it's, it's not really for like early childhood education, um, but 14 and up when you're transitioning from adolescence to adulthood and further on into adulthood. Mm -hmm. Here's another quote for you. Okay. This one is actually from Paul Vanderclay, not from Jordan Peterson, but it's based on, I think, his understanding of Jordan Peterson's work. Okay. Your disadvantage is your superpower. Okay. Yeah, that's probably based on Peterson's whole idea. Like, I don't know if it's his quote where he says, the, th the thing that you're seeking is in the place where you least want to go. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um... I don't, I, can you say that again? Can you say the quote again? Yeah, well, and I'll, I'll give you the parentheses too. If okay. you, <laughs> your disadvantage is your superpower. Parentheses, overcoming, and, and this is so obvious, it, it almost yeah. hurts, but that's the way most <laughs> truth is, right? Yeah. Overcoming hardship produces greatness. Yes, well, yes. That is, by the way, that is the, that is the Nike business model. <laughs> in its entirety. That is how they became, you know, a global, comp a global brand. That's what they sell, that, that one sentence. Um, and we buy it because we know it intuitively, we feel it, uh, and we've experienced it as a species. Um, I don't know that I would define it as a disadvantage though, because by definition, it becomes an advantage. Um, so words are tricky in that way, but I get what he's saying. Um, I'm trying to see if I can apply it specifically to like, well, I think in terms of like, as a, as a way of understanding the, the development of wisdom, like wisdom as a concept, um, if, we, if we are to hold that wisdom is something that more or less un, is unchanging because the human condition is more or less unchanging, then I, I would say that like the ability, for example, to know that you must confront the fact of your own mortality or wrestle with that in order to uh, become wise, I think that that is an idea that certainly, you know, I teach in the theory of enchantment and that is an idea that would be a natural outgrowth of that statement um, about disadvantage. Cause like it is a disadvantage that we will die one day. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, that's the biggest disadvantage. Right? Yeah, and yet the ability to make peace with that is one of the biggest advantages in the world. Well, you know, we were talking earlier about how everything is so meta. Yeah. And, and to me, there are a couple of rules that are meta all the way down. And okay. this is one of them, really, because this is basically saying the same thing as saying limitation is necessary for creativity. Yes. And this is how this is how the this is how you can see how this marries the benevolent father with the benevolent mother. Right, because the benevolent father is limitation, right? Discipline, order, and the benevolent mother is creativity, uh, the ability to 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 look at chaos and the unknown and create out of it. And you know, he talks about this when Peterson talks about this when we're talking about you know the Tao Taoism and the Yin Yang concept as well. Um, so yeah, I think that that is a perfect. Um, description of how the archetypes can be balanced and merged together in a healthy way. Well, and see that the, the space between mm -hmm. it, the boundary, the space between all things, all things have a boundary. Mm -hmm. Particles have a boundary, molecules have a boundary, yeah. cells, you know, people, we all have a boundary. Everything has a boundary. Yeah. But what keeps us in, it keeps us cohesive. So we have an inside and an outside. Yeah. But the edge is also a connection. In, in art, the edge connects the different pieces of the painting, mm -hmm. each other, right? Yeah. So the, and the edge has to have a certain quality to it to maintain that connection. So mm. if you think about cells in a living being, they they have the 
they have a boundary that keeps the cell integrated, but they also mm -hmm. have the capacity for osmosis for things to travel back and mm -hmm. forth. So the boundary has a certain mode of being that mm -hmm. permits connection mm -hmm. and also permits protection. And yeah. so those, those things go all the way down, but the, the boundary is necessary for cre creativity. The limitations are necessary for creativity. And like I said, these things are so obvious that they've been <laughs> stuff our mothers have handed down forever. Necessity <laughs> is the mother of invention. Right. Yeah. 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 Very, so, very meta. But it is, very I think meta. that goes to your earlier question, or your, I think it maybe was a quote that you mentioned where someone was still, was not, could only see the tyrannical aspects of the father. Mm -hmm. Like this just demonstrates like why the benevolent aspects of the father is necessary for, or how it's necessary for creativity. Like you can't have one without the other. Mm hmm. Well, and the other thing I was thinking about is both of those aspects, the tyrannical and the benevolent, um, part of the gift that we're given by having to confront both of those aspects is that those are two opposite things that have to be held loosely in order to mm -hmm. see what's actually there in the space. Because mm -hmm. if you look at it only as tyrannical, you can't truly see who the father is. And if you look mm -hmm. at it only as benevolent, benevolent you can't yeah. truly see who the father is you have to be able both. to see both of them right which is why i teach kendrick lamar in the theory of enchantment because one of his songs kendrick lamar says i got power poison pain and joy inside my dna so this is like contemporary pop culture embodying the same ideas that we're talking about that are ancient um mm -hmm. and he's like articulating his ability or his awareness of his inner complexity of his capacity to produce the benevolent and his capacity to produce the destructive mm -hmm. and this is a constant theme throughout many of his albums him sort of wrestling with himself and confronting himself and confronting his potential both good and bad um, so again this is something that repeats itself you know even in contemporary form and my whole thing my whole call to action especially for my generation is to not take pop culture for granted but to actually consider that there are important aspects, important wisdom that pop, even contemporary pop culture um, contains within it. Mm -hmm. Well, the culture of the past was pop culture at some point. And exactly. That handed yeah. down to us, right? So we're yeah. continually passing on these traditions and mm -hmm. that's so great. Okay, let's see, I, let's see if I have one more. Okay um the walled city inside the walled city mm -hmm. we're safe from barbarians and chaos but then the negative side is that we're also trapped inside the walled city sure okay but without the walls you're destroyed by the barbarians mm -hmm. so an ordered structure and a certain model of relationship all of that is what constitutes the great father mm. but the benevolent father must make sure that the hierarchy doesn't become so steep as to become unclimbable. Mm. Right? So yeah. that's, I think that speaks to what has been happening for the last many years in this country for. You think it's become certain, more and more. Certain groups of people, the hierarchy. Yeah. I mean, on the one hand, you could say that. Um, if I try to separate things out here, and I'm going to try to do this without being political, mm -hmm. you, you can have all the agency reside in the system, or you yeah. can have all the agency reside in the individual. That's well put, yeah. So if, if all the agency resides in the system, then it's not my fault. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but if all the agency resides in me, then why is it that I just can't make my way out of here. Right. And maybe it's because sometimes the the mountain is just too high for some people yeah. uh, for some reasons. Yeah. There are, there are reasons that cause the hierarchy to become too steep. Mm -hmm. The 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 um, the hoops you have to jump through and the effort required to get the latter are just mm -hmm. too complicated, too difficult. 
you know, yeah. regulations can do that. Um, um, situations that that incentivize poverty mm -hmm. can mm -hmm. do that. All yeah. of these things can make the hierarchy too steep. So I just wondered if you might want to speak into that. Yeah, that's an interesting observation. I think. I think the way I think of it is like the the individual and the society and the community surrounding the individual and the nation at large, and it's like, I hear I get what you're saying in the sense that, um, if if a person is raised, for example, in a in a home that's destructive. Uh, and is not given the necessary tools for their own, you know, maturation and spiritual edification, and the tools with which to even view the world in a in a net positive as opposed to a net negative, mm -hmm. then they're already disadvantaged in that sense. Uh, and then when they encounter society, they will see they will encounter society through that lens, which will create a self-fulfilling pro which will likely create a self-fulfilling prophecy of course there's always like the potential for the interruption of that process right because a mentor can randomly come into that person's life or, but that notwithstanding if a person um you know encounters society with that perspective that can become a self-fulfilling prophecy uh and then the negative aspects of their life can sort of redound all the way down um and so so many things are i think a lot of this is the individual agency acting with the agency of the system simultaneously and the tension between the two. And so I think you would have to ask the question, well, how do you, how, how is it that you can balance those two things? Um, Cause I don't think the agency exists. I don't think all agency exists within the individual. And I don't think all the agency exists within the system, whatever that means. It's sort of weird when, when I hear about like, the system as a sort of disembodied thing as having like no impact uh or as have as not being impacted by the human beings that make up the system like that's a very strange concept to me um but i understand that things take on their own sort of a way of being um but yeah i think that you know certainly if you if i were to sort of like look at the state of education in the country look at the state of economic inequality in the country um, and other various issues. And then you put COVID-19 on top of it and you sort of exacerbate it because of what's happening with a lot of the unemployment. And then you and then you put the impact of the media or some of the media in it, which is incentivized, I think, from a financial perspective to actually just broadcast um, tragedy <laughs> constantly yeah. and division constantly because it gets a lot of clicks and it gets a lot of eyeballs. And that's an, that is an example of agency in the system, I think, becoming too overpowering. If you're already an individual that hasn't had the upbringing that would give you the tools to be able to see the, the beneficial aspects of the society that you live in, then yeah, it can really, it can collapse on its, on its own weight, I think. Um, and I know Peterson says, like, you know, the walled city is safe, except for the, it's safe from the barbarians outside, but there are always the barbarians within, right? Yeah. The barbarian within yourself, right? Um, so one must always be on guard. Um, and this is, this is why, for me, like, it's so important. A lot of people are talking about, like, you know, reforming the system and changing the system. I believe in sy system reform, but no one is talking about reforming the system within themselves. No one is talking about being on guard so that the barbarian within themselves doesn't rear its ugly head and then like contribute to a lot of the negative things that we're discussing. So both conversations have to be ha happening simultaneously. Well, it's so interesting because when you were describing the news media, yeah. just the language that you were using, my immediate image that I got in my mind was worm tongue. As he stands behind the oh, yeah. king, whispering evil thoughts into his head. That's Wait, just this is from Lord of the Rings. From Lord of the Rings, King yeah. Theoden of Rohan is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's kind of like, oh yeah, like this all the time because Wormtongue is always yeah. telling him all these negative things, and so he's he's just grown to believe it. He's he's become completely enervated and, and right. asleep and and given up, completely hopeless. 
and and that's exactly the role that the media plays they're yeah. they're just always putting these lies in our ears making us believe the worst of everything about everybody yeah and uh it, yeah, it that's a good image. all the energy and creativity out of the, the society, out of the culture, out of the individuals, and yeah. people feel hopeless, right? Yeah, it's very unfortunate because one of the conversations I had with my friends was that it's not like positivity doesn't sell. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, like positivity sells, you know, so I just think it's short sighted. If it's purely from a financial incentive or from, from a financial motivation, I just think that's short sighted. Mm -hmm. You know? Because positivity does sell. So I don't know. It's really frustrating to witness. Well, yeah. And, and when positivity sells, it has a dual impact in that it, it generates more enthusiasm more energy more wealth more mm -hmm. spendable income for people to mm -hmm. increase the pie and yeah get the whole thing generating uh people who are nourished and flourishing and yeah right. <laughs> yeah and we we often we often think about the notion of a self-fulfilling prophecy only in a negative connotation but i like to remind people that if it's positive positivity can also be a self-fulfilling prophecy <laughs> mm -hmm. you know well Chloe, you are the poster child for positivity. <laughs> Thank this you. Has, this has been an incredible conversation, and I know your time is really valuable, so I, I don't want to keep you any longer than what feels good to you, but if you that, had yeah. anything you wanted to add or if you had any questions you wanted to ask or anything, now would be the time. Um, what is your, do you have like, is, you've spoken about Lord of the Rings often, but do you have any favorite like pop culture films is lord of the rings like your like what does the lord of the rings mean to you because i've noticed that you've brought it up multiple times well i i just because i've been thinking about theodana rohan in in connection to your um mm -hmm. your enchantment thing and i i've also been thinking a lot lately about the nature of addiction mm. and that okay. that um this john verveke talks about this reciprocal narrowing which is a a um, relationship that happens between the agent and the arena okay so when the agent makes a move and they whatever move they make causes the arena to shrink a little bit then mm -hmm. the arena gives back the feedback so that the next move that the agent makes is another move that causes the arena to, to shrink. shrink a little bit yeah. more and so so addiction does this because it keeps narrowing your scope of interest you get addicted to this uh, thing and you're only looking at that thing and that further narrows your world and then you need the thing more and then that further narrows your world and then you I need it even more so you're kind of drilling yourself down in this hole yeah this reciprocal narrowing so that kind of addiction has a and, and I think about it because I've, I had a problem in the past, still struggle with it occasionally with food. Mm -hmm. And it has this reciprocal narrowing thing where, well, I can't really go do that thing because I really need to eat something right now. <laughs> you know, like, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, or I mean, some people it's drugs or alcohol or whatever. It keeps you from becoming who you could be because you're only focused on this one thing. Yeah, it sort of narrows your horizon. Yeah. Yeah. And so, enchantment uh, the negative kind of enchantment does that because it mm -hmm. narrows you down to this you know you're in a trance mm -hmm. that's it you know yeah, yeah yeah um whether it's sleeping beauty on the you know asleep at the wheel or what you I know i did think whatever. about that i did think about that when you said that when you mentioned uh the king in in uh lord of the rings who was asleep because i remember but in sleeping beauty it was the fairy godmothers who put everyone to sleep as if like they needed to go to sleep. <laughs> well, she went to sleep because, um, let's see, her parents felt, how did that story go? Remember because once the fairy, once the three fairy godmothers realized that she had, been, had had her finger pricked and fall, had fallen asleep then they said okay what we're gonna do is we're gonna make the whole kingdom fall asleep until 
the one who has promised defeats the dragon only by, by defeating the dragon and of course it's a metaphor but only by defeating the dragon will the kingdom be able to awake again okay okay yeah but when she pricked her finger that was that was not a benevolent that was Correct. The, yeah. that was the negative side yeah yeah the the three fairies that may have been some benevolent idea but the the original pricking of the finger was the negative side mm -hmm. My pop culture references are really whatever we're watching at the moment. And okay. um, I mostly watch YouTube videos of physicists and chemists and oh, cool. you know, speakers and people like you and, uh, and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I ran into you on the original interview you did with Dave Rubin a couple of years ago. That was, oh, yeah. Yeah. Two years ago, I think. You. Yeah. It was a really yeah. good interview. Thank you. Um, but our family watches one thing together every evening and that's our kind of family connection time and okay what we've been doing lately is going through monk oh wow yeah my mom's super into that show so <laughs> i've probably seen because my daughter liked it a lot when she was little and now she's an adult and mm -hmm. we're watching it again so i've probably seen every episode at least two or three times wow and it's very interesting because in terms of just the uh, what you can learn about human personality, disordered personality, and mm. all of those things from watching Monk and from watching how people relate to him and how they either accept him or reject him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah, it, that is interesting. It, it makes for interesting connection points in conversation where, you know, we can say, oh, this is just like that thing that happened last yeah, night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the, in like a key. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Yeah, I haven't seen that show in a long time, but yeah, maybe I should check it out again. That's cool. I think one of my favorite series of all time, what that I just thought had such a beautiful narrative arc, especially when I went through it the second time, because first time it was weekly TV. We'd watch it every week. Okay. And the second time I saw it, I binge watched it on, I don't know, Netflix or something. So I got to see the whole narrative arc not just of each episode, but of the entire mm -hmm. four seasons, I think, was Chuck. Did you ever see Chuck? I haven't seen Chuck. It's, um, he's a, a computer nerd. Okay. And somehow accidentally, the entire database of the CIA gets downloaded into his brain. <laughs> okay. And so the CIA sends a protector, a woman, to be his protector to keep him from getting you know, picked up by some criminal enterprise that could yeah. unload what's in his brain. But over the course of four seasons, he also becomes a hero. That's cool. So, so there's the female hero who's his yeah. protector, and then he eventually becomes a hero. And uh, is that still on Netflix? Do you know? I don't know. Um, at some point, I wanted to watch it badly enough again that I bought an extra some five dollar thing on on amazon prime mm -hmm. there was some extra channel that amazon had that was showing it for a while gotcha. it was only on for four seasons and actually i think it was only on for two seasons and they were going to cancel it and then there was such an outcry from the fans that they oh well for two more seasons <laughs> so good for it's them one of those it has a cult following but it's not you know it's not one of the all-time famous series or sure like i'll check i'll check it out i'll look into it yeah well, this has been fantastic, Chloe. Um, I don't know if you'd ever be willing to come back again, but. <laughs> yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah. So maybe next time, what did you say you were working on in Maps of Meaning right now? I'm on the adversary. <laughs> the adversary. The okay. archetype of the be, adversary, which is brilliant. It's so good. It's, it's so like, yeah, like the adversary shrinks from the unknown and like has such a, has such a cowardly, um understanding of the unknown that the the adversary basically comes to hate existence itself it says better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven mm -hmm. and there's that whole dynamic of power as well mm -hmm. you know, that plays a role in that so it's interesting. yeah that would make for a great conversation especially yeah. with today's political scene yeah okay very, uh very what would you say uh timely so <laughs> yeah 
Well, after you've had a chance to look at your schedule and see when you might have an opening again in the future, let me know and, and sure uh, thing. I look forward to talking to you again. Likewise. Thank so you for having me. I post me. this online, right? Yeah, 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 of course. Okay. And if you have any links that you want in the information section of the video, just send them to me. I will put okay. the uh, teachable.com. Perfect. The I'll also send you the basic theory of enchantment website. Okay. Perfect. Thanks so much. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night.